Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Lesson number five, I believe, talking about angels. And we are in a section talking about the nature of angelic beings. Last week, we went over the fact that angels or angelic beings are spirit beings. Looked at a couple passages there. And we talked about angelic beings being innumerable to human beings. God knows how many angelic beings there are, but uh, we look through passages in the scriptures, we see that they are innumerable. And I do apologize to a degree that uh, I took up a lot of time last week talking about uh, uh, the book of Ezekiel and some of the things that were going on there uh, about spaceships and supposed spaceships. Important thing to remember, the figurative language that is being used there. I maybe didn't get this expressed enough. The, the picture that is there is a picture of a portable throne this is God's throne, portable throne. He, it's a vision that uh, Ezekiel sees. And don't think of it as a spaceship. There's a particular reason God was in control. And in Ezekiel, what, Ezekiel chapter 10, as we were looking at it, uh, God's throne came down to take what's called the Shekinah, the presence of the Lord from the temple before the Babylonians destroyed the temple. To take that presence back to the heavenly realm. So that, when we think of it in these terms, who destroyed Jerusalem? In 586 B.C., well, it was the Babylonians. But who allowed it to happen? God did. And that's a lot of what that vision that uh, Ezekiel was seeing was trying to uh, communicate to the people. You went into idolatry, and God allowed this to happen. God's going to take care of it. The temple's going to be rebuilt. The, the presence of God will come back, but you're paying for your sins in this sense, being uh, in exile in Babylon. So, number three in this, angelic beings do not have flesh and bones. Well, yeah, you said in the first one there, Spirit beings, yes, but can we remember that we also, as human beings, have a spirit component, correct? Okay. Because the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being, living soul created in the image of God. We have a spirit, but we also have flesh and bone and blood and all those things. So the angelic beings are spirit beings, but they don't have flesh and bones. Luke chapter 24, verse 36 through 43. After Jesus' resurrection, so this passage can be used to teach along many different lines, right? There's many different things happening here. As they were talking about these things, and that's the 11 apostles and maybe even some more people there, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. Well, why would they think they were seeing a spirit? 
because they saw him being killed on the cross and put in the tomb. Some of them witnessed that, right? And he said to them, verse 38, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet that it is myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So that automatically takes away a theory that, well, when Jesus was resurrected, it was just a, he was just a spirit being. When he was resurrected, he, it was a full bodily resurrection, flesh and bones. The spirit came back from the Hadean realm, back to that body. The body was raised from the dead. That's what a resurrection is. And he's telling them, here. A spirit does not have flesh and bones. I got flesh and bones. I'm alive. I was resurrected. I would say he still had blood, too. Doesn't say it, does it? Doesn't say that. But his side, I think, would all be bleeding again. Mm -hmm. And from the cross, there is when when the the soldier pierces his side out from that comes blood and water plus there was blood all over the place but I think the the what's trying to be said there it, it wasn't just a trickle of blood and water it was like a fountain of blood and water that poured down out of there much like when Moses struck the rock back in the book of Exodus, and then was there once in Exodus, and once in Numbers, or twice in Numbers, but there's like a fountain opened up. That's what happened at the cross. So all the blood was gone, right? For a spirit does not have flesh and, flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet so they could see where the nails had pierced. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, did you ever have anything like that? That something was so joyful that you still couldn't, just couldn't believe it was happening? Yeah, it's wonderful. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate, ate before them. But did he need to eat? He's showing them that he was actually alive. But he's showing them that he could eat, right? Because if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this perishable body must put on imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. All those things that it talks about, once he's resurrected, that body is not going to die again. Now, understand, Lazarus probably died again. Uh, Tabitha in the book of Acts, Dorcas probably died again. All those other resurrections, they probably died again. This is why Jesus can be said to be the first to rise from the dead because he's not going to die again. And then at the end, when Jesus comes back and we're all resurrected or changed, the last enemy is defeated, which is death. But he's the first for that to happen. Is that understandable there? So when you're reading in the scriptures and you see that, well, he's the first. Wait a minute, there were, forget about Lazarus. No, remember the context of what's being talked about. Never to die again. Okay, 
So, spirit beings, uh, innumerable, don't have flesh and bones. Because angelic beings are spirits, they are not subject to the limits of the material creation. The laws of nature don't apply to them like they apply to us. Gravity. Now, what we've talked a little about, a little bit about angels and angelic beings flying, but can they fly? Could they just rise up and go? Yeah, because the law of gravity doesn't apply to them like it applies to us. And you think about Jesus resurrected, how did he go to heaven? Rose up, all right? Now, but taking it back, think about how angels typically appear, and when I say appear, come on the scene in the Bible. And I, I've just got a few examples. You can go back. You can find them walking from a long distance, like when they come to Abraham, when Abraham's in his camp, times like that. But lots of times, you get to the point where you see that the ange an angelic being can travel from heaven to earth instantaneously. Just like, boom, through be an angel just appear right here. Daniel chapter 9, verse 20 through 23. Daniel says, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God. Jerusalem, right? Mount, excuse me, Mount Zion, where the temple was and was going to be destroyed apparently at this time, or maybe just had. Verse 21, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel. Now we know Gabriel was an angel. Archangel. Well, we'll see. Maybe. We're just going to stay with this. But Daniel says the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. Swift flight. What does that mean? Flying. Just here. Oh, when Charlie robbed the bank and took off, he was in swift flight, wasn't he? Came in. But he wasn't flying. Remember how words are used, okay? But there he is. I know, I know. Everybody would go home now. Did you know Charlie brought the bank? <laughs> no, Charlie didn't draw the bank, but I know of. Uh, he was handy. But but see, at the time of the evening sacrifice, so where was the evening sacrifice taking place at? At the temple, so the temple's still there, but what? About to be destroyed. Because Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to Babylon in 606, and 20 years later, the temple's destroyed and Jerusalem's destroyed. What was that year? 606? 606. B.C. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, the four that you read about in uh, Daniel chapter one, two, three. Yeah. Okay. And he made me understand. 
the angel who appeared as a man, Gabriel, made me understand something, right? Speaking with me, verbal communication, and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come out. Come out? If he comes out, that means he had to be in. Where was he? He was in heaven. And he came out of heaven in swift flight. Right? I have come out to give you insight and understanding. Daniel sees things happening and is wondering why are these things happening and Gabriel is going to give him some insight. This is why these things are happening. Even though Daniel pretty much knows. How do we know Daniel knows? Because he's praying and he's confessing his sins and the sins of his people, Israel. Right? That's what the prayer is about. So he's getting this insight to give you insight and understanding. Verse 23. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out. And I have come to tell it to you. So he was in. The prayers go out or up. And then a word comes out. Well, where does the word come out from? I'm looking to, for something more specific. From the throne, from God, the word comes out to Gabriel, who's going to take that message to Daniel. And I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Why was Daniel greatly loved? Well, there were several reasons. You go back and read the book of Daniel. But one of them was, what was he doing? He was speaking and praying and confessing his sins and the sins of his people, Israel. God says, now, that. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. The word comes from the throne. God hears the prayer because Daniel's greatly loved. The word comes out and the angel gets the word and boom. I come to give you insight and understanding. That, that's faster than AT&T can get to. Surely faster than the post office. Right? So but travel from heaven to earth instantaneously. Luke chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense, and Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Now, this is Zechariah, or Zacharias. This is John the Immerser's father. In Luke chapter 1, he goes into the temple, into the holy place, to put incense on the altar of incense, getting ready for the high priest to come in. Okay? But he's offering this incense, and he's the only person supposed to be in there. So, if you're looking at it, all right, this is the altar of incense. And back over here is a curtain. I believe the shoe bread's over here and the lamp is over here. But there's a curtain here, and back in here in the most holy place is the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat and the two cherubim. And the Shekinah presence of God is between those he comes in, comes up here to the altar 
of incense, and he's doing that. And on the right side of the altar, incense, now be Gabriel, okay? Man appears. Gabriel appears. Where'd he come from? Back there, from the presence of God, the most holy place. Because it's on the right side of the altar of incense. You can come through the back door and around. You can't do there. And that's why I, I kind of one of the places where in my thought these angelic beings or even God's presence it's, it's just like stepping through a curtain they're just on the other side of this curtain we see in three dimensions right What's the fourth dimension according to the twilight zone? Time. Time. Okay. So, you know, if if fourth dimension is time, in eternity there is no time. Right? So beyond what we can see, boom, it's just it's there. And they can just travel right through, like walking through a curtain, like an actor on stage walking through a curtain. Now you see, now you do. Now you don't, now you do. But that's, that's my reasoning. You can think about whatever, but think about how fast Gabriel got there for Daniel. Acts chapter 12. Verses 6 through 9. Now when Herod, and I believe this is Herod Archelaus, I believe Antipas comes later. Herod the Great is already dead. He died about 4 BC, about two years after Jesus was born. That's when he died from the world. This would be the one who dies from the worms. Yeah. I believe it's Archelaus. All right? Now, when Herod was about to bring him, that's Peter, out, out of prison, he had already had John, John the Lesser, killed. There were two apostles named John. Right? Remember that. So this isn't like Peter, James, and John. This is the other John. He had that John killed. Now he's got Peter in prison. And he's about to bring him out. On that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was for he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And as they, he goes out, the doors open, gates open, all of this stuff is going on. And again, it's, it's you, you picture Peter in the inner chambers of this prison and these guards are all around and this angel just appears in this chamber where Peter is and then they just walk out that's always 
interested me and when they walk out amongst them are the soldiers frozen with fear or are they temporarily blinded we don't know but i always wonder you, know, you hear all the time where he just walked through the crowd and on yeah. yeah, it's it's mir miraculous, but it happens. And to the point where the next morning, when they send for Peter, he's not there. Where is he? Uh, he's down in the temple. <laughs> no, no, that's not that's not the time when he's down in the temple. But. Anyway, it's it's like how did he get out of here? How did this happen? So it, it's not a man coming in, and the angel doesn't even come in through the gates and the doors and such, but appears there, at, but doesn't miraculously take Peter out, say grab a hold of him and fly him out of there or anything but walks him out with gates and doors and such opening and in front of all these these guards. But the main point was he's just there. He just appears there. touch something that has become popular culture. Just like the spaceship last week. Okay. And this is something that happens on a I don't know. I, I want I want to say a higher level, but not so much a higher level as I, I don't know who's propagating this or whatever, but you, you understand, if you watch movies like Star Trek and shows like uh, Star Trek was yeah, had movies and, and a TV show. And they would use the, Scotty would beam them up and beam them down and this and that and all. But there was another aspect <coughs> where, and I think some of the Indiana Jones movies may have touched on this. And perhaps, have you seen Babylon, like Babylon 5? Yeah. Is that about oh, Stargate? Yes, yeah, Stargate. Okay, and what what Stargate about? When you travel to other worlds through the interdimensional portal. Through a portal, yeah. through a gate, yeah. and you, you just go into that gate and boom. They see, now, and I've talked about, you know, Others talk about multiverses, uh, and they'll use Flat similar feet. things, the gates and and such, uh, that you enter this portal, then you end up in another multiverse, which, you know, you've got your clones or whatever, people just like you in these other multiverses, but, you know, it's kind of like a decision that you make here out of 40, 50 decisions that could be made, there are 50, say there are 50 decisions that you could make, uh, there are 49 other universes out there for the other decisions that, that you didn't make, that you did make, but you, you, you're in the other universe. Okay, back to the Stargate deal. And you were talking about a ladder. Did you say something about a ladder? No? Okay. Well, in the book of 
Genesis, Jacob is has to run from home because Esau has been kind of cheated out of his birthright. So he's going to run back to where his mama come from. But on the way, uh, he has a pillow or a stone for a pillow and he's at this place and he wakes up and he sees a ladder and he sees angels coming down and going up that ladder. And that's called what? Jacob's Ladder. When I was in high school in Glee Club, we had to sing a song called Jacob's Ladder. We are Jacob's Ladder. Well, it was angels climbing, not us. But, but he said this is a special place, so he built an altar there, did whatever. Well, there are there are people who believe that again, those are aliens from outer space. And that there are certain places around the world that are these portals where people from outer space or beings from outer space or these other dimensions come through. Okay? And that those are the major places where you will see religious religions forming, starting, and protecting areas. Thus, the temple in Jerusalem would have been built in a place where one of these stargates, portals was. So if you control that, one of these, you know, that's pretty important, right? Okay. Then, uh, of course, Rome would be one, and Salt Lake City would be one, but Mecca would be one, and they have some through the Middle East, and, and it's kind of the idea that many of the wars that have been fought, big wars, are wars fought to gain control of these portals. Follow me? Are you, do, I, I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm not espousing the idea, okay? Again, just like with what was taught in the book of Ezekiel, and people will say, that, that's a spacecraft, okay? And I told you last week, I heard a congressman saying that. It's in the Bible, we got spaceships in the Bible. No, you don't, okay? You have people espousing these ideas. Right? So, Angels appear just about anywhere. When they do appear, when it's talked about in the Bible. And we haven't even got to the point where it says we could be entertaining angels unaware. I thought it'd be interesting. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but when people start looking for things to be able to control other people, Think about the Indiana Jones movies. And when people get an idea in their head, and then convert other people to that idea, it can lead to some pretty drastic results. 
the, the Nazis in leading up to World War II were very uh, highly, how do I want to put it, involved in a cult, in the occult. In false religion, in in I say idolatry, a lot of their their thinking, their ideology revolves around uh, the Norse gods. Just something to think about, I guess. Um, I didn't scare anybody. Today. But they wouldn't term them as angels. They would term them as aliens or beings from outer space. They probably scared me if I had angels sitting here by me. Oh, but <laughs> uh, an evil angel, especially. But yeah, uh, and, and we'll get into it later on because you see the reaction of even the apostles and other people. Daniel, you know, wow, there's something about that. This isn't normal. <laughs> Looks like a man, but there's something very special. So it's distinguished. But then again, in other places, like uh, Abraham, one there there are three three beings that appeared to Abraham. Okay, I'm going to talk about the promise to him. Two of them are angels or angelic beings that go on down to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. The third one is the Lord. And he appears. But to Abraham, they're just three men. He knows they're special though, but they just appear as men. And that's why the admonition that okay, we got to be careful. We might be entertaining angels somewhere. Uh, yeah. Well, not today. I've explained that. <laughs> He's locked up. Okay. All right. So, questions or comments?